Lindsey Buckingham's signature fingerstyle guitar is perhaps as recognizable as the countless classic songs he wrote while he was in Fleetwood Mac. Buckingham is a self-taught guitar virtuoso and songwriter who famously joined Fleetwood Mac in the early 70s with his then-girlfriend, Stevie Nicks. Their split and the subsequent mega-success of Fleetwood Mac's 40-time platinum-selling album, Rumors, has become classic rock music lore. Nearly half a century later, tensions between Buckingham and Nicks are still very much alive. In 2018, Stevie Nicks supposedly had Buckingham fired from Fleetwood Mac after he asked for some time away from the band to work on his solo album. On today's episode, Bruce Headlam talks to Lindsey Buckingham about how he and Stevie Nicks never really got closure after their breakup, and how that affected their professional relationship in the decades since. Buckingham also explains why he and the band took such a drastic creative turn when making Tusk, the follow-up album to Rumors. And he reveals why after recently filing for divorce from his wife, they never really separated. This is Broken Record, liner notes for the digital age. I'm Justin Richmond. Here's Bruce Headlam with Lindsey Buckingham. So tell me about this album. Well, you know, I have had this ready to go for three years at least. I had actually finished it, you know, right after Christine McVie and I did that duet album a few years back. And we had, Christine and I had done a tour. And it was my intention to, you know, put this current album out back to back with that and do at least an American tour uh, behind it uh, before embarking on another Fleetwood Mac tour, which was already in the works. And I went and asked the band if I could have an extra three months before we started rehearsing for the Fleetwood Mac tour. And there was some resistance to that from at least one member. Mm -hmm. So it got put off at that point. And then, uh, you know, a series of other things occurred in the interim that, that kept it on the shelf. You know, one was having a bypass surgery a couple of years ago. And then, of course, the pandemic. <laughs> so, you know, which put everybody on hold. So, it you know, it's, it's uh, been a long time coming. But as I say, it has been ready to go for a number of years. And it's nice to finally get it out. You know, listening to it, there's a lot of different kind of songs. There's a lot of sounds. Three or four of the songs, if you told people these were like extra tracks from a kind of classic Fleetwood Mac album, they'd go, oh yeah, that makes total sense. Well, you know, it was funny because I was, and when I began working on it, I, I, you know, I've always defined my solo work as being a bit more off to the left and, or a lot more off to the left and, and more esoteric. Obviously in doing that, you lose a large chunk of potential listeners who don't really get what you're doing because it doesn't resonate with their preconceptions of you in Fleetwood Mac. But when I got, you know, into working on this album, I really was thinking about making just a a straight ahead pop album, you know, with a few, you know, odd touches as well. But so you're, you are correct that uh, many of these songs do sound very much in the spirit of, the style that that I applied to Fleetwood Mac as well. Mm-hmm. Now, there's others like Scream, which is the first song, which, you know, instantly when you hear the opening of Scream, you're like, oh, that's Lindsey Buckingham play the guitar. You could just you could blindfold people. Maybe. It just, <laughs> it's just just like you. It just sounds like you. You know, that could be from Seeds We've Sown or other yeah. other albums you've made. And a couple others I just want to ask you about Blue Light, which I thought was just an outstanding track and and probably one of those that sounds closer to Fleetwood Mac than your solo work. Yeah, you know, it's got sort of a sh- a shuffle kind of bl- bluesy bass combined with something you might have found in Holiday Road or I'm not really sure exactly how to characterize that. But again, the the content of the lyrics is just about a long-term relationship and celebrating the fact that you go through all sorts of things and that all sorts of challenges can and do present themselves, uh, especially the longer you're together. And that, you know, if the love and the 
the clarity is there that you will always rise above that and you will never succumb to, in this case, the, the blue light. Okay. Now, your personal life is, I know you filed for divorce. Is it? We, well, you know, we have, but there's no, there's really, it's a work in progress. We're not really sure what we're doing. I mean, it was, that was done at a moment in time, but I think there's a lot of uh, interest with both of us to try to figure this out. Mm-hmm. And and I, I had no idea how many people actually file and never follow through, you know, it, uh, I guess. I didn't it, know that. I didn't either until I uh, was, was uh, made aware of that. I may file later today. I didn't know that. Hey, you know, if you got nothing else to do. <laughs> <laughs> now, you grew up in Northern California. I did, yes. Around Palo Alto, Atherton, actually. And was there a lot of music in your house growing up? Well, you know, I, I probably, in fact, I can say with certainty that I would not be here now doing what I'm doing had it not been for my older brother, you know, I was an avid listener of the music that was in our household when I was very young, three, four, five. Uh, if it wasn't children's records, you know, it was what your parents bought for themselves. So I was an avid listener of, you know, South Pacific soundtrack and some of my dad's Dixieland Jazz 78s or Nutcracker Suite or whatever they happened to have, you know. It's funny you mention that because because we had a Nutcracker Suite. We had Peter and the Wolf on the other side of it. And right. th- those records were just magic when you were a kid. Well, you know, Nutcracker Suite, all of those songs are actually, I, I see them as great pop constructions. You know, they're, they're, they're really very uh, accessible, even though technically it's classical music. You know, I mean, they're very thematic and, and very sort of kind of structured as pop songs, you know, and yeah. I always loved that about that. Anyway, so I I was already attuned to, you know, a, a sort of a fine, attentive level of, of listening, even when I was very, very young. But then when I was about six, my older brother, Jeff, came home one day and said, well, there's this new singer. His name is Elvis Presley. <laughs> and of course, I couldn't even imagine what this guy was going to look like. I was picturing like a Fred Astaire or something in a top hat and tails. I didn't know. So he started bringing home Elvis and and he's but every he was an avid collector of all the early great rock and roll whether it was Chuck Berry or Johnny Cash or Jerry Lee Lewis or Fats Domino. I mean everything. So without my brother being such an avid listener, I never would have taken to the rock and roll and it was such a revelation and it's not an uncommon story with people our age uh, where I you know it, suddenly there was this music that was for us it was not for our parents and it was something brand new and uh, of course that's when I started to teach myself to play guitar ukulele first and then eventually six string guitar and I just by buying a chord book and learning to play all of those rock and roll songs and so that I could sing and play them mm-hmm. it, it was it was an exciting time you know and and what happened with the music in our house was that th- that lasted 1960, 61, and it started to fall off in terms of the impact and the newness. And at that point, folk music took over for me. And I started listening to a lot of mainstream folk, Peter, Paul, and Mary, Kingston Trio, and and learned how to finger pick, learned how to Travis pick. And that, you know, became, uh, that really informed the style of my guitar playing at that point. So when you left high school and you did start pursuing I know you went to college for a couple of years. Yeah. And you did throw yourself into the music business. What did your family think? Did they think, eh, he'll give it a couple of years, we'll support him? Well, it was kind of incremental because, you know, I only got into a band because I had been asked to play guitar in at an assembly my senior year, and we did that. And then we all graduated, and then all of the people in that band ended up at San Mateo Junior College the next year. And we decided to get the band back together and to try to see if we could, you know, actually get some work. Uh, because one of the, the keyboardist was actually a, a very skillful writer at age 18, you know. 
And at that point, we were looking for a, a, a different girl singer because the one we'd had had moved away. And so that's when Stevie came into the picture. You had known her in high school. Is that right? He, she transferred in as a senior to Menlo Atherton High when I was a junior. And so we, we knew each other. We'd met each other a few times at social events. And we both were aware that the other sang and played guitar. Mm -hmm. And there might have been sort of a, a very subtle mutual attraction, but, it, it, you know, nothing that was played out in any way. And then she went off to college the following year, and I stayed and finished high school for one more year. So I didn't see her for a year. Right. You know, but we knew she was a singer, and we knew she was at San Mateo where we were all at college, and so we asked her to join the band, and she said yes. And at that point, we also connected with a, a manager who was a, a hustler kind of guy at, uh, who was at going to Stanford, a guy named David Forrest, who actually was a very good manager for us at that point and started getting us gigs at high schools and uh, clubs and things, or you know, local stuff. And so, you know, the, the way my parents took all of this in was, as I said, to be supportive of it. Uh, we needed a place to rehearse and they were willing to soundproof the garage and let us rehearse there five days a week to my dad's probably my, my poor dad coming home from work and having to listen to this stuff every night. <laughs> but again, I was just doing it because it was two things. One, it was just an, an extension of my love of music. And I think the second thing was that after high school in 1967, when I graduated, that was, I, I, you know, I started to deprogram a bit. I started to grow my hair out. And, uh, you know, the whole summer of love up in San Francisco was happening. And obviously the Beatles had had a huge influence on the world. Mm -hmm. But anyway, I would, I'd grown my hair out. And so I was starting to think of myself as someone who, wasn't going to be probably what my parents expected me to be, although I wasn't actively thinking about a music career per se. I was just happy to be in a band and enjoyed the gigs we were doing and enjoyed the involvement of that band. And that lasted, you know, about four years. And we ended up trying to get a record deal and failed. But at that point, there was interest in Stevie and myself had you written stuff by this point? No, this is what I'm saying. I, I had, I still had not written songs, and I and I'd been playing bass for four years. So when suddenly there was all this interest in Stevie and me, that's when Stevie and I got together and became a couple, and that's when I said to myself, I guess I've got to start writing songs and figure out how to do that. I'm fascinated. When you sat down to write a song. Did you like listen to a couple other singers or how did you even begin to do it? Well, I think there were there was, you know, again, I think Cat Stevens was a big influence at that time. I think some of the, the guitar work was influenced by Jimmy Page and the fact that he was really doing a good job of using acoustics and electric, sometimes in the same song. Uh, a song like Frozen Love, which is this big ep epic ending, you know, is sort of influenced by that. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I just kind of made it up as I went along. I had a, I had managed to get a, a, an old Ampex 4-track tape machine. And so in the kind of the mode of Les Paul playing everything yourself, I started putting stuff down and combining tracks and, you know, which I still do today, right? Mm -hmm. But that was also a help in terms of, you know, figuring out how to write. And Stevie and I basically came up with an album's worth of material and worked on it probably for 10 months or a year and then figured it was maybe time to, to shop it in Los Angeles. And, and we um, had one attempt at doing that, which was kind of led to more or less tepid responses, I would say. Mm -hmm. And at that point, you know, I still wasn't so driven that I that I would have done what Stevie suggested we do. St Stevie said, Lindsay, if we're going to make a go of this, we've got to move to L.A. We've got to be where the action is, you know. And that's not something I would have done on my own, yeah, be probably because I lived in one place my whole life and I loved Atherton and Palo Alto and the Bay Area in general. She, on the other hand, 
came from a family that got uprooted and moved almost yearly because her dad was quite ambitious and and, uh, kept either changing jobs or kept getting promoted, which required uh, a, a move from city to city. So she you know, it was a, a much easier proposition for her to think about picking up roots and moving to L.A. So because it was the two of us and because I, I sensed that she was correct in, in her intuition there, we did decide to move to L.A. And luckily, luckily enough, Keith Olson, who was one of the people we'd met not too long before, invited us to stay at his house for a few months until we until we could find a place and was also instrumental in in helping us get a deal and obviously was a brilliant engineer and and co-produced the uh, Buckingham Knicks album as well. So we we picked up our roots and moved to L.A. And and again, I I probably wouldn't have done that without Stevie. Mm -hmm. But then because, you know, you're known as a studio guy, you're known as a producer and a great arranger. Did you learn that through the process of that first record? When did that interest start? Well, you know, I think I just had it in me, and I, I that's all I can say. I mean, I, if I were to go back and listen to the Buckingham Knicks album, I think a lot of that holds up quite well, uh, you know, in terms of the, the musical vision I had for that. And, and I was only 22, but, you know, I think it, so much of it comes from having been oriented to music for, for the better part of my life and having started so young. And maybe even the fact that I, you know, was so self-sufficient as a guitarist and had taught myself to play. And I figured if I can do that, I can teach myself to record. I can teach myself to produce. And it all kind of came together in, in one kind of fell swoop. You've said years ago that just because you you guys were so busy and there was so much around the band that you you could never really process your split with uh, with Stevie Nicks. Right. And I don't know if that you've been you've been married for a long time. You've got adult kids. But it's interesting to me that all these years later, part of the Fleetwood Mac show when you're there is people kind of watching that time in your relationship. She's singing Landside and they're looking at you or you're singing mm-hmm. The Chain. Are they looking at each other? I, I can't think of anything else in popular music like it. Maybe Simon and Garfunkel, if they ever sing again together. But it's, 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 <laughs> this, but it's this strange thing. Did, did you ever feel when you, when you were with them, and God knows you might be again in the future. You could be. Are you reliving those feelings? Because that's what people, that's what they're looking for. Well, you know, I I think you have to start with the fact that Rumors as an album was so appealing, not just because of the music, but because of the subtext and because of the fact that these songs, the the unique, as you said, it's unique to have three writers and it's unique to have three writers that were basically couples, Mm -hmm. you know, so, so Christine's writing songs to John. Stevie's writing songs to me. I'm writing songs to Stevie. I mean, that the musical soap opera of that, the real life aspect of that being laid bare on vinyl at that time was irresistible. You know, thank God the music was as good as it was because it, it, it you know, otherwise maybe the <laughs> the album would have eventually been seen as only that. Yeah, it created fabulous music I'm, and people yes. love the music. I'm, I'm not downgrading that, but... No. Part of it is this little drama they're seeing on stage. Yes, and and people responded to that. I think they related to it in their own lives. And I think they respected the fact that somehow we were able to rise above all those difficulties in order to keep our eye on what appeared to be our destiny at that time, even though we didn't know what that destiny was, and, and to get on with what we needed to do as a band and creatively for the big picture. But in doing that, you had to kind of compartmentalize all your feelings. And, you know, a therapist would probably tell you it's not the most healthy way to go about, you know, getting closure because I, I would have to see Stevie every day and I would have to make the decision to do the right thing for her, even though I was in pain. 
and there was never any any physical distance to get closure. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, I think there are echoes of that that are still tangible sometimes on that were still tangible on stage as recently as a few years ago with Stevie and myself, because those issues never really got resolved. You know, mm-hmm. they kind of got pushed under the rug and, and, and yet completely exposed to the world at the same time. Yeah, you're like a, a shell shock soldier. They just keep sending them back to the front. Right, yeah, yeah. <laughs> does, does that anger resurface? Like, do you ever want to say, you know, and now Stevie's, or, you know, she thinks, well, now, you know, Lindsay the jerk is going to sing a song about me. Right. Or is it is it all professional? No, I, I, I think it's all sort of, you can take many steps back and, and look at it philosophically and obviously for me you know meeting my wife and having children relatively late I mean I I saw so many people that I know who were trying to be rock and rollers and live the lifestyle and also be parents and spouses and failed at at those and I I wasn't going to be one of those so you know I, I had that as well you know to fall back on and to redefine myself and so uh no I I don't think there was ever uh a time when those feelings got, at least not for me, I can't speak for Stevie, you know, she, she may still be working that stuff through. I, sometimes I thought that her, some of her reactions to things and, and her involvement in what happened a few years back with the band, you know, was somewhat based in that, but I, I don't know. Yeah. It's just interesting that you did a terrific album with Christine McVie and it had all that kind of magic and I don't know how well it sold, but I think, and I'm sure the tour went well, but, you know, if you announced tomorrow, I'm going to do a, an album with Stevie Nicks, I'm not saying this is happening, but, you know, you'd be on the front page of the New York Times. People, yeah. it's, even though it's 50 years old, people are like, they've just seized on to this in an incredible way. Oh, it would be so, so circular and karmic. It would be crazy. The story about how you two join Fleetwood Mac is, it's famous. That yeah. Fleetwood was in the next studio. He heard... Your guitar playing, he was looking for a guitar player. But what interests me is when you joined. You know, for example, there are whole books written about Lennon and McCartney and about the sort of psychology of their relationship, how they were friendly but competitive and they pushed each other to new heights. You joined a band that had three main songwriters, which is pretty unusual. And all three of you started to get better. Like if you look at, you know, the top 20 Fleetwood Mac singles, all you guys have written a bunch of them. Uh, you, Christine, and Stevie Nicks. What was that dynamic like when you joined around songwriting? It was interesting because if, if you look at the whole thing of, of us moving to L.A. and getting a deal and having that album come and go and connecting up with Fleetwood Mac, it all happened in a relatively short period of time. And clearly, Stevie and I were prepared for the the opportunity that was coming our way, although, you know, that opportunity had yet to really be defined. You know, one of the things that that was in our favor going into Fleetwood Mac was that we had been demoing songs for a new album. So all of my songs that are on that first Fleetwood Mac album and all of Stevie's, Rhiannon, everything, and I, there's one, Crystal, which was from the Buckingham Nicks album, but all of those were completely worked out and very much in the form that you hear them, you know, minus the rhythm section of, of John and Mick, per se. And so there was no sense of having to interact you know, to sort of make something happen because we all were somewhat self-sufficient. I will say that that in, I remember very clearly the first day of rehearsal that we, we had, you know, before, as preparation for going in the studio to make that first album, that, you know, Christine started showing me some of her songs and I immediately realized that, that one of my big contributions to Fleetwood Mac it would be as a musical leader, because she needed a, a little bit of insight and a little bit of guidance on some of her songs that I was able to give and, and to take them to, you know, fruition. A song like Over My Head, where we completely remade the bridge from what she she had it. So, you know, the writing remained succinct, where where each of us 
had our own process. There was never any sitting around and co-writing, but there was a lot of interaction in terms of record making, for sure. Okay. And you all wrote alone. And then did you each present your songs to the group sort of for your consideration? We'd like this for the next... Yes. And was it a good group to present to? Were people open things or were they... Who do you think you are? Or Well, I, I think, you know, Mick drove a lot of that. Mick and Christine, especially, were very open to what we had. And you have to remember, Mick heard my guitar solo in Frozen Love, or maybe the whole song, which has a lot of great finger picking in it, too, and asked me to join Fleetwood Mac based on that, you know? So mm. he was he was an incredibly intuitive guy. And you have to realize that, that he... And Christine and John had been keeping the band barely above water for a number of years. You know, they'd had this brilliant beginning with Peter Green, and then Kiln House was was great with Christine and Danny Kerwin. But, you know, there were all these albums that that were in between, which were kind of non sequiturs from album to album style-wise, because different people kept floating in and out of the band. And the reason that that happened was because Mick was intent on making sure that the band stayed together and stayed alive at whatever the cost. And, and also Mo Austin, who was president of Warner's at that time, I give him a ton of credit for even keeping him on the label. It's not something that you would find happen today. If, if your bottom line is not, you know, something you can make the boardroom happy about, you're going to be off the label. And, and in those days, he had the not only the intuition, but the autonomy to make a choice about Fleetwood Mac and say, I'm just going to leave them on the label because, you know, there's something good here and let's just see what happens. It's interesting that today there's no way that band would have reached that level where they would have brought you and, and Stevie Nicks in and had the kind of success. That's right. They would have been probably disbanded by then. So, you know, those kind of happy accidents are much fewer uh, today. So, you know, I mean, I think... Mick in particular was very uh, had a great sense of overview about the mat which material to choose and what would make a a great overall album and there was never any any sort of territoriality about that any cynicism about that i mean the closest thing i can remember to anything like that was just a a side comment from john to mick one day where I think he was talking about the song Blue Letter or something that was, you know, relatively California, if you want to call it that. And I think he, he said to Mick, well, it's a long way from the blues, you know, and but, was, you know, he was he was into it. Everyone was into it. We could tell immediately there was this great chemistry. You were also the arranger. What would you do with a song like, you know, Dreams or something that Christine brought in? Were you, were you the one who sat down and said, well, I think the, the solo should go here, or why don't we try this sound? Totally. On on a song like Dreams, if you heard it the way Stevie brought it in, you know, she, she wrote it on the piano mm -hmm. and basically was playing it with like two fingers, you know, these two chords back and forth, the same two chords for the whole song, which is great, but it was so in need of delineation. Mm -hmm. It was so in need of, of one section being set apart from the other because there was the potential for a chorus and, and a passing section and a verse, but none of that was framed or was set up. So, you know, all the orchestration that you hear on a song like Dreams was just something that came out of my head, you know, because I understood what the song could become. You know, if you took those sections and treated them uh, with a sense of departure from one to the other. So therefore, you got, you know, a fairly empty verse with just sort of answering licks. And then you got a, a passing section where it's building tension and I'm doing this up and down picking thing. And then it, it hits into the chorus, which is, you know, a chorus must have a sense of arrival. Then the harmonies come in and other instruments kick in and uh, it's just a thing, you know. What was it like for you in particular to work with Mick Fleetwood? Because he, like you, I don't think he'd ever had a lesson. No, never. <laughs> He's a very intuitive player. I've, I think I've heard you say in the past that he never plays the same thing twice. That's right. Which is a, it must be a little maddening at points. How did you guys get along? Because, you know, you mentioned Dreams. When I think of that chorus, I think of he comes in a bit late on that big cymbal crash. And it's just it's such a big moment in that song. 
Right. Uh, but and it's very it's it's all feel. It's not. I don't think anybody else would play it that way. No, no. I mean, I I completely uh, related to where he was coming from and how it was all intuition and feel for him. And he and I were, you know, were and are, you know, kind of soulmates because of that. You know, we we both love the same things about music. If there's anything frustrating for Mick, it's that he's got so much inside that he feels and is not articulate enough musically to express, you know. I mean, he he could be probably be a great writer, but, you know, he he's certainly the best drummer I've ever worked with. It's interesting. He would he doesn't know how to write a song. Well, he he'll come up with certain raw ideas and 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 they they all have a sense of soul to them, you know. But he's there's there's hardly ever anything like completion, you know, because it's just not part of his DNA in that sense. But uh, he, he's a magical guy. Mm -hmm. His, he's always been someone who was amazing with the overview and yet was some in some ways timid about what he could and couldn't do, which is part of what makes him great, because what he does do is just so natural. And, and so it just flows, you know. Well, also, you, there'd be a lot of leaders of bands, you know, particularly a band like Fleetwood Mac that had some success. It may have been back on its heels at that point. Not a lot of people would say, well, let's get Lindsey Buckingham. And he says, we've got to bring his girlfriend along. Like that was a pretty radical change for the band. It was. And he could see that. And probably a lot of band leaders wouldn't have. Well, yeah. And you, you have to give him credit for a... When I said you got to take my girlfriend too, for him saying okay, and you got to give Christine credit for that, you know, for to do I want another girl in the band, mm -hmm. and yet, you know, I think there was this again this this sense that there was something unique about it that we couldn't quite define yet. It it, it was all done on intuition. I mean, our our decision to join was was done on intuition. It wasn't a clear cut big break for us you know we we weren't sure that it was the right move to make at first because we didn't know where Fleetwood Mac was going but you know it's it did become clear fairly soon that the chemistry was was amazing and that the synergy was creating something greater than the sum of the parts you know I mean that that first album only took a you know four four or five months to do and what came out of that you know just just hit, we hit the ground running it was crazy you know, part of that synergy is your vocals with Christine's. Now, I know everybody, mm -hmm. because of the romantic relationships, they talk about the band in terms of you and Stevie. But when did you realize how well your voice melded with Christine's? Because there's there's something, and, and you guys did an album a couple of years ago, and that magic is instantly back. It, it, your right. voices sound fabulous together. I know. It's weird. I, I think it's because Stevie has a... A, a much more uh, defined style with her vibrato and and it, it's a bit nasal and when I would harmonize with her to some degree it, it just created a different thing Christine and I were almost we, we both had slightly more deadpan approaches to singing mm -hmm. and I think that when you put that together side by side, it, it just creates a kind of a symmetry, which really shines and, and is so balanced, you know, I think that's what it is. So after Rumors, you did Tusk, which was very much your project. And it's it's what people associate you, the, you know, the guy in the studio, kind of, you know, diagramming it all out very, very precise, mm -hmm. in a way that working with Fleetwood Mac always seemed a little bit chaotic. Yeah. When you talk about your own, when you do your own albums, you do all the instruments. It seems like a very, it seems like a different side of your personality, the very precise side. Mm -hmm. Is it kind of a relief after all the sturm and drang around Fleetwood Mac to say, okay, I'm just going to sit in the studio and do it the way I want? Well, I, I always thought of the processes as being two different things. I, I always felt that working with Fleetwood Mac was probably more like making a movie because, you know, you come in, you've got songs, you've got certain preconceptions about things, but everything is, is kind of 
more political and, and more conscious in terms of the choices you're making. There's a lot more talking about what you're doing. And working on my own is probably more analogous to painting because you are probably putting yourself in an environment where you potentially are going to be able to discover more things because as a painter does with his canvas, you know, you're sort of one-on-one -on -one and at some point, wherever you think you're going, you might, you might get led in a different direction by what's going on on the canvas. And so those two things, I think, are both important for me. And, you know, the Tusk album in particular, obviously, it's been said before, but I was really just motivated to make that change from Rumors because Rumors was so successful that at some point the success detached from the music and kind of became about the success. And I think we were poised to possibly start to paint ourselves into a corner because, you know, the, the, the kind of the corporate formula is uh, if something works, run it into the ground <laughs> until, it, until it's dead and move on. And that's not really the, the formula to try to aspiring to try to be an artist in the long term. You've got to continue to take risks and to follow your heart yeah, and not do what the external world is expecting you to do. And so that was really the psychology behind the left turn that, that I orchestrated on Tusk, you know. It's quite an insight you had because anybody else would say, well, we're doing rumors too. Right. And I'm sure Warner Music thought you were doing rumors too. Oh, yeah. they were. I would love to have been a fly on the wall when they first put Tusk on in the boardroom and we're probably going, what the hell is this? <laughs> <laughs> but it, it's an interesting whether people and people argue about Tusk. And I know it's it's maybe your favorite album of your Fleetwood Mac records, but it's a great insight that you thought, no, 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 we got to change at the height of the insane success you guys were having. Mm -hmm. Were you listening to other music and saying, no, music is changing and we're going to fall behind. We're going to look like, you know, we're going to look like Dean Martin or something if we keep doing this stuff. Well, maybe in a small way, but I really, I think as successful as rumors was that there were things that we didn't cover in terms of breadth or, or depth or, or just risk taking that, that I felt strongly about. And, and you do have to layer on top of that, the fact that, Right around the time, you know, the year or so before we started doing Tusk, that all of the new wave stuff had, had come over from the UK and Europe and, and the, you know, the new waves from America, too. So there was it wasn't so much that that stuff influenced me per se. What it did do was it just reinforced what I was already kind of feeling and it gave me more courage to act on it, I think. Mm hmm. Was, were there particular acts or sounds that you found captivating or, or helped convince you this was the right way? Well, I mean, again, there's nothing that I could say was directly influential, but I mean, I loved Elvis Costello and I loved The Clash and I loved The Police. And uh, I mean, I loved kookier things like Devo, you know. Mm -hmm. So, uh, I mean, it was all stuff which was undermining the status quo in one way or another. And um the, I, I just felt that there was, we were at a point where we might, again, start painting ourselves into a corner. And you see a lot of artists who do that, and they do follow through with solely the external expectations. And they start to forget who they are. They start to forget why they got in the business in the first place. Mm -hmm. And it's, if you don't, if you're not protective of your your creative world, and you start to let it go, it's a lot harder to get it back. How has it been dealing with Warner over the years then for that reason? You know, I know there was a time, uh, I can't remember what solo album it was, but the, the label wanted you to hold off and they wanted some of the songs for Fleetwood Mac. Have you found they've been as accommodating or do you always feel the pressure to like, can't you guys just do rumors again and, and make us a, a billion dollars? Is that, is that so wrong? <laughs> Well, you know, it, it sort of came, uh, the the kind of retro reaction did not come from Warner. It came really from, from Mick and the band. But yes, uh, and I'll get to that in a second. But no, Warner, my experience with Warner has always been 
good because the people that were there, whether it was Mo Austin or Lenny Warrenker, I will say that I always felt like they didn't quite know what to do with my solo albums. And again, I can't blame them for that because the albums are not Fleetwood Mac albums. And I think they were probably sometimes as baffled by some of the content as as the fans were. And and that's a choice you make, you know, if you're if you're going to pursue something that's going to help you grow artistically that maybe you can't do in Fleetwood Mac and you lose nine tenths of your audience doing it, then you've made a choice. But, you know, the idea of, of going back to a Rumors 2 or, or something more conservative was actually orchestrated by Mick himself. Because what happened in the, in the post-Tusk environment was that the band had gotten very drawn into the album when we put it out and was very happy with it. But when it, and it was a double album, right? But when it didn't sell another 16 million, and I think, you know, as a double album, it probably initially sold something like four. And so Mick came to me one day and he said, well, Lindsay, we're not going to do that again. You know, because I was working out of my house and I was bringing in tracks that I had started and having them add stuff to them and sort of combining the movie making and the painting. And there's some there's some pretty, uh, you know, experimental things on Tusk, yeah. especially of mine. And so Mick put the kibosh on that. And it was really only then that I started making solo albums because I realized that if I were to continue to explore the left side of my palette and was being prevented from doing so in the context of Fleetwood Mac, the only way I could do it was on solo albums. Mm -hmm. But you did hits on solo. Your, I think your first album had Trouble, which was a big hit. Trouble, and then there was Go Insane on the second one. But, you know, they, they've been a little fewer and far between. And and obviously, I'm my drawing power on, on live shows is, is completely different, you know. Mm -hmm. Although I will much rather play a theater than an arena, uh, just right. aesthetically, you know. So people know, you know, about the all the drama around rumors and the couples breaking up and everything. Those, those are very well known stories. Mm -hmm. I was I was amazed to read that uh, I think on the the first time you left the band, it was eighty seven, maybe was it after Tango? I think yes, that's right. That you know, you said you left in in part because the drug use was so heavy, and I think I think something about like Mick was living in a trailer on your lawn or something. What happened was we recorded the Tango in the Night album at my house. I had a studio in my what had been my garage, and the alcohol and substance intake which had been a part of the subculture for everyone you know for years it was starting to hit critical mass you know mm -hmm. so during the making of tango in the night and trying to produce that album it got to be quite difficult because people just weren't all there some of the time physically or mentally and i think out of the uh, X number of months, or probably close to a year that it took us to make that album. We probably only saw Stevie for a few weeks. And Mick was actually living in a trailer for quite a while in my front yard because he didn't want to drive home at night when, <laughs> when the sessions were over. So, yeah, I mean, and, and so when, when we finished with the album and I was quite happy with the result, I, I felt we would triumphed over adversity to a point, and I'm still really proud of that album. I had a bunch of hits, that album. Yeah, and it, it had elements of what I'd learned. You can make a connection between some of the tone, tonality of like Go Insane and Tango in the Night. And so I was happy with that. But I And then I started thinking about the road and how the road, is, in terms of craziness, is usually about times 10 what the studio is. And I thought, I don't think I can do this. You know, I think I need to make a, a little survival move here. And so I opted out of the tour, uh, much to everyone's disappointment. But, you know, clearly it was a, a good thing for me at that time. Yeah. Your other long relationship in the music business is with Irving Azoff, uh -huh. who, you know, his, was your agent. But he's the one who phoned you a couple of years ago and said, 
they don't want to tour with you anymore. I mean, was that mm-hmm. weird to hear from from the guy who'd been represented? Well, is he your agent or is he the band's agent? Or? Well, he was he was my manager for a number of years, and he w- was an, an agent in the sense that he was, you know, putting he was involved in putting together Fleetwood Mac tours and was taking a cut of those tours. So, in a sense, he was an agent for the band, but he was my manager. And I, I would have to say about Irving, I mean, I, I like Irving, but, you know, he probably never would have gotten involved with me just for my solo endeavors. Uh, in fact, out of all the time that we worked together, I think he came to one solo show of mine. Really? And Yeah. And, um, you know, obviously Fleetwood Mac was where the money was. Mm-hmm. And he's shall we say, been known to follow the money. And so um, if you backtrack to this whole, the atmosphere that was created right before that, which was actually brought on by what I was talking about before, about my asking for those three months to tour before the Fleetwood Mac tour started, that was the beginning of the tension that led to what certain members or member, I should say, uh, eventually orchestrated and Irving (laughs) I I don't know what to say about that I mean I think he was as invested in the Fleetwood Mac tour at that point as he was in protecting me Mm -hmm. and so when someone in the band calls him and tells him I don't I don't want to be on stage with Lindsay anymore I find or I found in that circumstance he wasn't really standing up for me. He he was you know passing on information but he was arguably throwing me under the bus a little bit, you know. Mm-hmm. So that 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 was how uh, our relationship ended because after that even though I expressed some interest in continuing to work with him it didn't happen and um so you know that was that was it with Irving. There's one song on the new album that is about Fleetwood Mac, On the Wrong Side. Can you tell me a bit about writing that? Well, I think I was just in a situation where I had already begun to feel that that some of the, the ethic that you could say was sort of shared by everyone was, was sort of moving too far away from my idealism, which I was still maintaining. And, you know, the older you get and the more it just becomes a gig or a job and the more that you have played that same group of songs over and over again. So, you know, you, you see people start to kind of give up the possibility of growth on a creative level. And, the, you know, different people wanting different things also plays into that. I mean, you get the inner band politics, which can often thwart a greater potential that we might have had as a band, maybe to go in and make another album or to to do many other things. And I think all of that was starting to make me feel like I'd been in this game now for so many years and wouldn't have traded it for the world, but that it, it was this high pressure kind of situation that I was starting to feel I was getting a little tired of and was was losing touch with a little bit and it it sometimes made me feel that i was a bit on the wrong side by being a part of it Mm -hmm. so you're going out on tour with this album what's that going to feel like to go out and play in front of people after all this time i'm not sure what it's going to feel like you know we've only been in rehearsal for about three weeks Mm -hmm. and probably this week we will start running the set the whole set that we've got once or twice a day, and, uh, you know, I mean, it's been a long time. I, I'm not sure if the, the bypass I had a couple of years ago is going to have any effect on my stamina. You know, there are some finer points that are still yet to be revealed about it, but beyond that, and of course, you know, it was very surreal sitting around for a year plus during the pandemic, as it was for everyone, so, you know, it, it's just, it just feels like it's been so long since this, this album was actually done. And so much has happened 
that's been, shall we say, challenging. So, I mean, I, I feel like I'm a different person than I was when I first wanted to tour this album three plus years ago. So it, it is going to be interesting to see how it all plays out. Okay, well, people should go see it because it's a great album. Thank you. Thank you so much for doing this. It's just been terrific to talk to you. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. Thanks to Lindsey Buckingham for taking us through his musical history. You can check out his new self-titled album, plus all of our favorite Lindsey Buckingham and Fleetwood Mac songs at brokenrecordpodcast.com. Broken Record is produced with help from Leah Rose, Jason Gambrell, Martin Gonzalez, Eric Sandler, and Jennifer Sanchez, with engineering help from Nick Chafee. Our executive producer is Mia LaBelle. Broken Record is a production of Pushkin Industries. And if you like the show, please remember to share, rate, and review us on your podcast app. Our theme music's by Kenny Beats. I'm Justin Richmond.